we turn to our last uh, speaker and she's an art and architectural historians studied art history modern history and didactics of the arts at the Ludwig Millions Universität in Munich um, and um, in 1988 Magister Arstrom with the thesis that Regina oh. between 93 and 99 was researcher and freelancer at the state palaces and garden of Baden-Württemberg and the State Gazette for Baden-Württemberg um, in Stuttgart, uh, a lecturer at the Institute for Architectural History at the University of Stuttgart, and postdoctoral researcher at the Department of History and Theory of Architecture at the Technical University of Darmstadt and uh, with the 1911 habilitation in architectural history and theory by the TU, TU Darmstadt. Since 2008, uh, Regina is a professor for the history of architecture and urban development and the uh, social minds. Um, thank you. My parents-in-law said I cannot pronounce any umlauts, so <laughs> I did my best. And Regina, we are very happy to have you on board. Dear colleagues, dear friends, I'm very grateful to be here and first and foremost I would like to thank Alona Nitsan Shiftan and her team of the Technion for this wonderful um, symposium for the perfect organization. I would also like to thank the Israeli team of our Erich Mendelssohn Initiative for their passion and great support for the idea. In particular, I want to mention Eran Mordohovic, the president of Ecomos Israel, who is leading the initiative in Israel through the struggles of the time. As last year in Berlin, the conference takes place on the days around the 21st of March, Erich Mendelssohn's birthday. He used to celebrate this day with his wife, his daughters, his friends and colleagues. Uh, and it was always a great event uh, with his, uh, in, in the Mendelssohn's year. His 50th birthday in 1937 was even celebrated three times. First uh, in London and then with the friends, oh, no, first with Louise in Capri, then with the English friends and colleagues in London, and then in Mandatory Palestine, as we already heard in the Schocken Library. And I'm behind my slides. This is what I wanted to show you because we were there last year on the 21st of March. It was when we visited the Einstein Tower in Potsdam. And this is the congratulation of the British uh, colleagues uh, to Mendelssohn on the occasion of his 50th birthday. It's something in the, it's in the Mendelssohn estate in the Getty Research Institute. So we follow uh, this habit and use the beautiful springtime after the very long and quite unpleasant winter in Germany to discuss and reflect his work on this special day. It's the beginning of spring, birthday of Johann Sebastian Bach and Mendelssohn. In this year, he would be 136 years old. I would like to join my lecture to the ones before me. As you may know, I had the pleasure to edit the correspondence between uh, Louise and Erich Mendelssohn. Uh, she, they started as a, she was a, not married, so she was Louise Maas, and they married in 1915. Uh, and you can find it online, and I, I show you this in order to invite you to, uh, to profit of that work. There are several registers of persons, places, you can, you can see it here, and uh, also uh, of all kinds of works of art, uh, of his own, but also books and concerts and works of all a kind of art. It is very interesting to see what he was reading, seeing, reflecting, what and who he found influential for his work. And I show you the young couple. For example, in, a, in connection to the earlier presentations, we know that he recommended Buber's three speeches about Judaism, Drei Reden über das Judentum, to Louise in 1915. But in the correspondence, there are only one letter from him about the book and two by Louise. Little in comparison to, for example, Wilhelm Woringer, Formprobleme der Gotik, there are five letters, 
uh, or very little in comparison to Richard Wagner's work with 25 letters and nothing in comparison to the countless letters that mention Johann Sebastian Bach or Ludwig van Beethoven. However, it is interesting what he writes about Buber's book to Louise. And I quote, I'm sending you here, my dear, Buber's three speeches with a letter to, to you dated 7 September 14, which unintentionally contains the strict confession of my Jewish blood. And exactly in that way that Buber tries to make it clear as a mixture. This touches, touched me wonderfully and stimulated many thoughts, which now ask their question differently than they did years before. More consciously, more persistently, with that lawful rigor that demands an answer. Three speeches. As written language, the style would otherwise be an impossibility and confused accentuation. Thoughts spoken, they justify these hardships. Read them silently for yourself and you will find many things that you found in us. End of quote. The dislike of Buber's style is compensated by the content that appeals to Mendelssohn. I use this note as a transition to my topic today, the letters, the sketches and the built work. In my view, they are inextricably linked to each other. So when we talk about Mendelssohn's buildings, we must also talk about the letters and the sketches. For the sketches, I think the necessity is evident because he prepared every building by a visit of the site and the sketches were based on observations made on these occasions. His designs were tailored to three elements. The building site, the observations made there, like where's the sun, where's the wind coming from, and so on, and the building program. Mendelssohn considered the building a success if its design corresponded to the first sketch chosen for its realization. And uh, this is a most famous uh, example, but all the buildings that are really... Um, try to, to bring the sketch really into reality. I would like to illustrate this close connection between letters, sketches and build works with the example of the Einstein Tower. We will find information about observatories as early as 1917 and 18. They led to observatory sketches from the Russian front and finally resulted in the construction of the Einstein Tower after the war. The climax of the topic was in June 1918, and it came back to Mendelssohn's attention no earlier than 1920, when the Einstein Spende, so when they got the money, was initiated in order to get the money for the building for the tower, of the tower. Mendelssohn was one of the very few German men that were not enthusiastic about the breakout of the war in August 1914. In contrast, he wrote on the 1st of August 1914, and I quote, so the madness of world war is imminent. In the meantime, you will have heard that the mobilization has taken place. I'm glad you didn't come to Munich. The conditions at the main station are indescribable. For us, it is just depressing to see that all culture is only a cloak for brute force, that the law of nature gives elementary proof of the power of the stronger and makes striving beyond it a phantom, end of quote. Other than many others, many uh, of his generation and the younger ones, Mendelssohn was already 27 in 1914, he tried not to be called for military service. Due to his bad eyesight, he was deployed in the office. From 1915, he was trained as a pioneer in the Searchlight Replacement Battalion. This is a translation. Scheinwerfer Ersatzbataillon in Spandau, of which he became a surgeon in 1917. Finally, in 1917, the time had come. In April, he was transferred with his unit to the Eastern Front. But they were lucky. Due to the domestical political reasons, 
in the Russian, the Russian front was very quiet at this time. In the course of February 1917, the revolution had taken place. The last Tsar, Nicholas II, was deposed and later killed with his entire family. He was replaced by a provisional interim government. This turn was deposed by the Bolsheviks as a result of the October Revolution of the same year. So Mendelssohn had only little to do. And I show him a wonderful picture of the, young, of the soldier. Uh, an extremely ex intensive correspondence began between the couple, who wrote to each other daily, sometimes three times a day, which made my work quite intensive also. The postal transport of the field post, post was, uh, worked extremely well efficiently, even though the letters had to cover a very long distance from Latvia in the far northeast of continental Europe to Bavaria in the far southeast of Germany. Mendelssohn's unit was deployed first in Gansau, then in Ilipan, and finally in Dünaburg, today Dagav Pils in Latvia. The situation was so quiet and secluded that Mendelssohn found time to design his shelter named Klein Stuttgart. And you can see it, uh, this is the, the, um, uh, just one of the letter envelopes. Uh, the, the couple kept everything, so the letters and the envelopes and the pictures in it and the drawings and the, uh, the dried uh, flowers that were sent back and forth. So we know really a lot about this. And this is Klein Stuttgart. Um, this is also part of one of the letters. And this, um, was um, the shelter was built according to his plans. Part of the shelter was a photo laboratory where Mendelssohn could develop his photographs. Around the shelter, and I, 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 no, I just marked it, there's a kitchen, there is the place for the soldiers, for his team, so to speak. This is his place, and there's even a terrace. So they really had a nice place for being in the war. And, uh, Around the shelter, vegetable and flower beds uh, were planted, for which, among others, Hekete Freundlich, the wife of astrophysicist Erwin Finlay Freundlich, sent seeds. They were friends of Mendelssohn's. To stimulate himself intellectually, he had the daily newspaper Berliner Tageblatt sent at the front, as well as current art literature political books and magazines. For example, Mendelssohn ordered the large book, Frank Lloyd Wright, Ausgeführte Bauten und Entwürfe, Executed Buildings and Designs, directly at the publishing house Ernst Wasmuth und Söhne. He commented on all these publications in his letters to Louise, who was his closest confidante. He also corresponded with numerous other peoples and exchanged views with them on political politics, arts, and architecture. Among them, the writer Ernst Kohn Wiener, the medical doctor Georg Kohn, and of course, the astrophysicist Erwin Finlay Freundlich, with whom he discussed the construction of observatories. For Mendelssohn's work as an architect, the months in Latvia became a stroke of luck, and I'll show you why. He had a lot of time and opportunity to draw, as he had no use for his spotlight train in the Baltic summer. There, the nights are so bright that no artificial lighting is needed. Mendelssohn used the white nights, the so-called white nights, to put his architectural visions on paper. He called them faces and regretted that there was no mechanical connection between the inner images and the hand drawing them on paper. The mostly tiny um, drawings he sent to Louise. It's just one example. Um, pencil sketches that fix the contour lines, as well as pictures in which he draws the spatial surfaces in starkly contrasting black and white. Louise sent him the drawing utensils and secured his ability to work physically by sending foodstuff from Bavaria like butter, <laughs> and quite practically by fixing the sketching following his instructions. 
we learn that the outbreak of Mendelssohn's creativity in 1917, the very many of his sketches that form the basis of his later work, was made possible through two facts. The kind of falling asleep of the Russian front and the very special conditions in the very north of Europe around midsummer, when the sun doesn't set lower than minus six degree. Anyone who has ever experienced the so-called white nights famous in St. Petersburg, will be able to emphasize with the ex excitement described by Mendelssohn. The body says, I'm tired. And the eyes said, say, you can't go to bed, it's daytime. During these so-called night watches, which was no night, when the light, however, was almost as bright as daytime, he created, on the one hand, pure fantasy works. We all know them. They are factories, ha aircraft, hangars, and even some sketches for music that he heard inside his head. There are letters where they exchange about certain pieces of music between Louise and Erich, and he drew them. On the other hand, he was already occupied at this early stage with the topic of observatories, about which he exchanged ideas with Erwin Finlay Freundlich. Since the correspondence ends in 19, November 1917, Erich most probably came home for the winter to be sent back to war in March 1918. Firstly, he took part, part in a 10-week training course for officer aspirants in Libau, today Lipaya in the very fast, far west of Latvia, so again in the east. After a two-week home leave at the beginning of June 1918, he was transferred to the Western Front, after all. He traveled via Gütersloh, Cologne, Aachen to Brussels and from there to his place of deployment, Pont du M, west of Lille in France. The front there was fiercely contested. He reported on air raids and umbrella lights which the British used to illuminate the front in order to light up the targets for their bombs. Pont du M was in German hands since mid-April and was kept until mid-September 1918. When you search Pont du M in Google Maps, all you see today is just a small roadside hamlet and the military cemetery for over 1,500 war casualties commemorated there in the middle of agricultural land. He was now a vice surgeon in the hand of Searchlight, Searchlight Squad. Due to the terrible, brutal military situation on the Western Front, he had much less time to design uh, architectural ideas and uh, the last Oscars gave four Oscars to the film All Quiet on the Western Front and it uh, shows obviously very strongly uh, how bad this kind of front has been. For me, the, it's a wonder that nevertheless, it was during the, that summer of 1918 that the designs of, for the observatory re later realized as the Einstein Tower in Potsdam was created. And I show you the trigger, the letter of Finlay Freundlich of the 2nd July in 1918, in which he precisely described his ideas for the Astrophysical Institute in Potsdam. Uh, and uh, you can, well, you can't read it. I'm betongtum, a, a, a tower of concrete. It's very cl clearly described what is needed. It's the clear program of that building, and Mendelssohn uses this. To, um, to create uh, the, the, the tower that was meant to be used as an uh, institute uh, to approve Einstein's theory of relativity. Mendelssohn corresponded intensively with Einstein, uh, with, uh, sorry, Finlay Freundlich, the spiritus rector of the project in Berlin. Uh, at the beginning of September, 19, uh, and I'll show you just uh, one of the sketches, an early one, which is very similar to, or very close to the sketch of the astrophysicist. I'll go back, because this is really a technical drawing. It's not, not really architecture. It's, he describes precisely what he needed. So Mendelssohn starts to design very near to the 
to the uh, to the design or the, the sketch of uh, freundlich and becomes more and more <laughs> liberate to uh, to to make a work of art, a work of architecture of this um, um, probable um, work. At the beginning of September 1918, Erich came to Berlin on home leave, only to be sent back to the front again in mid-September. Fortunately, one must say, he fell ill on the way and had to interrupt the journey shortly after the German border in Herbesthal near Eupen in Belgium due to the severe stomach pains and fever. He was transferred to a Bavarian military hospital in Halle, south of Brussels. There he lied until the end of October behind the front, which could be heard and from which wounded soldiers were brought in. Mendelssohn's condition improved only slowly I guess he had caught the Spanish influenza, which was rampant at the military hospitals. On the 27th and 28th of October, he was on the way home and rode to Louise from Aachen, where the train for the Leipzig made a stopover on the way to Berlin. So he wrote a letter, brought it to the post <laughs> in, in Aachen, and then the train continued its way. Immediately after his return, he founded his architectural practice. In 1920, many, le so th this was the end of the kind of Einstein Tower at this time because there was no money yet so to build the, 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 um, the tower and uh, there was the end of the war so nobody could think about building this um, institute. But in 1920, many letters document the working on the realization of the Einstein Tower. So after one year of break, Together with the documents of the building authorities and the institute, they mark, make the building process transparent. And I'll show you just uh, other sketches of uh, the, the tower. This is from, the 1920, from, from 1920, um, one that already shows the tower more uh, nearer to the later realized building. And this is another famous colorful sketch where you also see the nearness to the, to the uh, expressionist artists uh, he knew from Munich um, where he studied uh, architecture. So you may ask, why is this story relevant to the project of nominating outstanding works of Mendelssohn to UNESCO's World Heritage List? <coughs> Should we not just look at the buildings? Yes and no is my answer. Naturally, the buildings are the core of the entire initiative. They are the objects that must fulfill the conditions of the UNESCO. We are discussing the ones on the shortlist at present. But for a deeper understanding, we must see and explain them in the context in which they were created. We call this the narrative. What tells the story behind the buildings more than personal statements in letters, building files, books, records, letters to clients, friends and colleagues, assistants or lectures to students. Especially when they are supplemented by photographs of all the buildings and the family albums in the uh, Getty Research Institute. In addition, there is a collection of large slides with which he illustrates his lectures. The totality of the material contained in the two Mendelssohn estates in Berlin and Los Angeles is the breeding ground of our knowledge, which goes far beyond his build work. Show you a nice picture. I took the World War I years to explain what I mean. I could have also spoken about the period between the turn uh, of the year 1932 to 33 and the emigration in end of March 31. It's an amazing uh, exchange of letters, especially with Simon Schocken, who was not uh, in Berlin, and Louise was not in Berlin, so there was an exchange with uh, Erich in Berlin, and we know very well the discussions about these people where Louise and uh, Simon Schocken were in the, on the south coast of France at the time. Um, 
I, so I could also, ta again, I, oh, I'm sorry. I could have also taken the, the period um, around uh, 20, uh, 32 to 33, which is of the greatest interest in personal, professional, and general political terms. All the struggles of the Mendelssohns to become acquainted to the American way of life, including the change in the habits of the American colleagues when Mendelssohn began to be a rival for commissions. I chose my topic in order to raise awareness of the importance of the estate in the Berlin Art Library, Kunstbibliothek Staatliche Museen zu Berlin, and the Graduate Research Institute in Los Angeles. The works on paper, like sketches, letters, lecture, manuscripts, books, clippings, etc., are of great importance. To summarize, the well-chosen title of the conference is Erich Mendelssohn and the Architecture of Dialogue. I want to emphasize that the dialogical nature of the, his buildings become evident in the design process and in the many layers surrounding the built works. We need to bear this in mind when formulating the outstanding universal value and the narrative. The Mendelssohn archives are indispensable, but indispensable when dealing with Mendelssohn's work. Like with Oskar Niemeyer, they should be considered to become a UNESCO's memory of the world. By this, the UNESCO wants to enhance public awareness about the significance of documentary heritage among the wider public. I believe that the nomination of selected building for the World Heritage List should be flanked by the nomination of the works on paper as memory of the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>